screens here. This guy, I think. Does that work right for me? That's so what you guys see. I would like to see another view of that if that's possible. No. All right, this is the way we're going to roll then, I guess. You can see my mouse moving around. Yeah. Okay, right on. Let's get rolling then. Programmable logic controllers part C. So this ILM uh, introduces us to function block programming, function block diagrams, I guess you'll have to call them because that's what they're called, and structured text programming. So said when we started this, we're talking about the IEC 61131 uh, languages for programming. And of the five, we kind of dabble in all of them. Um, function block probably becoming more and more predominant as time goes on. Uh, ladder still kind of being the standard. So basically, the idea uh, with this ILM here is not of course, to make you guys a master of any of this by any means. Um, but the idea here is the objective states, describe PLC function blocks, sequential logic, and structured text programs. So you just want to be able to, you know, identify what the difference is between the different programming styles, how they sort of generally operate, um, and particular uses. Uh, I think the ILM goes into particular uses for uh, you know, the different languages. Why Why would we have five languages in the first place? Why can't we just get away with one? Uh, and the short answer is some of them are better at certain things than others are in terms of uh, resource management and, and how they uh, perform uh, the logic. So by no means are you going to be experts. Uh, the good news is that everything that we look at in in these different languages is directly related to uh, a ladder diagram that we looked at in the previous ILM. So just like learning another language, uh, you learn to say good morning and then you go on holidays and day two you're saying buenos dias. Uh, same idea, you're definitely not going to be fluent but you're going to have a very general understanding of, of the different languages. Alrighty, so let's go and describe some stuff. Okay, function block diagram is where we start, page two. And a function block is represented as a rectangular box with inputs on the left and outputs on the right. They are given uh, an instance name, and this is uh, similar to uh, a tag name. So switch 101 or FT, 101 or whatever you want to call it, just like we did in, uh, in ladder diagrams, they, they had tag names, so uh, address, you know, something like that. Uh, the reason you don't, and we'll get into this a little bit later, but the reason that you don't use addresses here like we did in uh, the ladder diagrams is with function block programming and most of the PLC programs, uh, you kind of set up a table where you assign uh, the channel on the input or output card uh, and then you get a chance to name it so typically you'll name your input you know switch one or on or off or whatever it is um, and then that ties back to a physical uh, address or a spot in the memory as it says here an instance name is a unique name given to the function block during programming and that's the key part there during programming uh, to reserve memory specific to the function it performs so uh, every function on or off, whether it's uh, you know two bits for a one or a zero, or an analog that takes eight bits or sixteen bits, or whatever. When we assign it, that's how that's how it knows. So, again, here in orange, uh, relating to self-test kind of stuff. Um, so when we assign a, a a name here, the instance name here, and it reserves that memory that's associated with that name, and there's all kinds of things that are associated with that name. Um, you know, if it was a valve or, or, or a PID block, for example, there'd be set point and all kinds of different variables. But again, you're, you're not going to be experts out of this. Um, so the process of reserving memory for a function block is called instantiation. And have fun pronouncing that one there, instantiation. And that's just the action of uh, assigning this to the PLC system. 
K, inputs and outputs. So basic building blocks is what we're going to go through first and how the, uh, the different languages kind of translate. And that's all this ILM really uh, is about, is showing you a uh, different way to write the same thing in a different language, just like it would be writing uh, from English to French or French to Spanish or Spanish to Chinese and vice versa. Same idea. Uh, I could show you pictures of it. And by the end of the day, you could probably do it. Um, but if I took the pictures away, you probably wouldn't be able to do it. Um, so the idea is at the end of the at the end of the day or a couple of days of reading, uh, you'll be able to, you know, on paper translate um, between these languages. Very simple, uh, very simple stuff. So inputs and outputs. We're starting to get into the uh, general idea of uh, what function blocks kind of look like when, in terms of programming. And again, every manufacturer is a little bit different on, on the way they've got their blocks and shapes and, and things of that nature. But in, in general, most of this stuff is going to apply. So we have uh, function blocks, of course, here. Uh, depending on the function block, you'll get a number of parameters that are available for you to uh, select or deselect, and they're associated to uh, whatever type of function it is, in this case, uh, an input here. So an input will come in from the left and come out on the right hand side. And just like a ladder diagram, it's read from left to right and top to bottom. So it's not different in the way that it functions. In this situation here, we're showing you the difference between a solid line, uh, which I call a wire connector. And that's the method of connecting these things. And when we get to the lab, uh, this will make more sense. I've attached a video at the end of the PowerPoint and I'll update um, after the lecture. That will give you some real life example. It's a video I just found uh, this morning. It's 14 minutes long and it's it's applicable. It's not the gospel, but it is applicable and it gets you introduced into uh, what it looks like in Logix 5000, which is uh, one of the systems we have here at the college. So uh, wire connector, this is a part of the software um, program. And this just a definition It's not really a wire. It's what they call uh, the image that you drag from here to here to connect the blocks together. Um, this represents a, I'm gonna hope I don't give this a dash line, Boolean logic, solid line is integer or real data. So transmitter type stuff, uh, discrete stuff, switches, etc. Okay, so flow left to right, top to bottom, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we can also do branches. Um, as we did in, in ladder diagram by uh, by function of the software. So click on there, you draw another line, and then we can use this in another uh, another function block. There are better ways to do this, um, but it's not something that's at your guys' pay level at this point in time. But just so you know, you can you can take a signal directly to another function block if you want to. Uh, more commonly, they'll they'll refer to it to a name. Uh, such as they have here. Uh, they all assign a name to that output, and then they'll reuse this name in the function block. So you'd have a couple of a couple of these here instead. But that's above your pay grade. Okay, uh, program execution again, as I was saying, like a ladder uh, program, it's left to right, top to bottom, um, and it takes data from the previous rung and then uses it in the next rung. This is a comparison we're trying to make. However, a little bit different uh, thing to consider here is this little loop back idea here. And you can't do this. Uh, and they've taken the time to show you that you can't do this in the ILM. And the reason that it doesn't work is the inputs due to the scan cycle have to be known before a scan cycle can initiate. So if this value is not, uh, is not known, I guess it would be this value. If this value is not known as, as an output with a tag like this, it can't it can't be updated. The, the value will be sitting over the value will be sitting over here unrecognized. So what you have to do to avoid that is as I was showing you earlier, kind of on this screen here where it's easier to assign it a name. Uh, that's what you do. You assign it a name. So you take this output, and rather than just trying to hardwire, quote unquote, get back to the to the front, you name it an internal tag, and then you introduce that tag as the input over here on this side. And that's just specifics uh, uh, 
to the way it needs to be done. Okay, uh, again, I'm not going to get you to know all the different rules uh, in function block programming, um, but a few rules. Uh, again, yellow for self testy type of stuff. Okay, function block. So just like uh, in ladder, again, this is all translatable. Different functions can be performed inside the program, uh, and we're going to talk about all of the same ones. So whether they're Boolean, compare functions, memory functions, math functions, timers, counters, subroutines, scaling, and many, 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 many more. Um, just just like you can in, in ladder diagram, we can do the same in function log. So a little flashback for you. I don't remember what year it was when you guys did digital or even if you still do uh, this type of stuff where you look at the ands and the ors and, and that type of thing. Um, but we're going to relate the function block uh, to the ands or to the ors so that we can make that you know translation between ladder diagrams. So an and or a Boolean and and it'll it'll say and in this block. I don't most programs won't have the ampersand symbol here. It'll it'll say and, but at any rate, generic shape function block. Take a couple of inputs, this and this. If they're both true, then the output will be true. So Boolean and symbol over here. And this is, I think, uh, something you have seen before. Can anyone comment to that? Have you guys uh, done this type of Boolean symbol stuff back in the day? Break the sign, change the line, break the sign, that type of stuff. I definitely remember seeing those. I mean, I do have an electronics background, so I know of it then, but we definitely touched on this stuff. I can't remember what year though. Yeah, it was, for me, it was like 1992. So um, again, we're just touching on it. This, this stuff you guys know, um, we're just showing you the blocks, the function, how the block works, and then we'll compare it to ladder diagram and you just go, okay, I get it. It totally makes sense. So basically, an AND symbol, input one and input two have to be true in order for Q to also be true. So we introduce the truth table, um, which should be reviewed from way back in the day. And it's saying that if input one is false and input two is false, then Q is false. If one is false, two is true, Q is still false because it's an AND. They both got to be true. So one is true, two is true, and the output is true. So pretty basic uh, stuff. We understand the logic. Logic is all the same. This is just, we're just writing it differently. Okay, an OR function looks like this. If input one or input two is true, then the output will be true. So input one is false, input two is true. This truth table is wrong. You can see my note down here in the bottom. Can anyone tell me um, if the ILM has been updated, I know I'm running version 21 of the IL. Oh no, I'm running version 22, and I don't think this has been updated yet. So you want to make a note on the bottom of that page. Let's see, page six here. Yeah, it's showing that. Uh, uh, oh no, yeah, it's right. This one is wrong, right? Because it's got to be one or the other is true, and you have right. pulses. Yeah, so. That's it, right true on this uh, page six. Yeah, so this one should be a one. This one should be a one, right, of either or of them. So values in the Q column of the truth table are incorrect. I just want to make that check. Uh, so it has been updated in your ILM. So your ILM, if you're running version 22, is correct. It should be uh, it should be as these should both be ones here also. So I, my graphic package for the ILMs is version 22. Um, I tried to, I'm sorry, is version 21. Uh, this is the image out of version 21 and that's why this is wrong. So in your ILM, uh, you should be good if you're running version 22. Uh, if you're not, change these uh, zeros to ones. Hope that wasn't too confusing for everybody. Okay, so that was the or. Now we have a not. So this is just the same as examine off and examine on. We have uh, 
not, and this is the same way that they do that. So if one is true, then the output is not energized. If one is false, then the input Q or output Q is energized. So it's asked backwards. I got to put you guys on pause here for a second. My daughter has just called here three times in a row, so I got to go see what's going on. Well, that was awkward. Sorry about that. Kid wants to be driven home from school. I'm like, well, that's not much I'm doing about that. So, okay, Boolean not. It's just a, it's an inverse of the input. So nothing new here. It's just like a examine off or examine off. If it wasn't this way. Um, you'll see that they have a function block here that's called B not, which stands for Boolean not. Again, changes between different manufacturers. Um, but most often it'll be represented in a shape and we'll discuss that later. Okay, so let's do our first little translation here and see if we can make a relationship between uh, these, these function blocks, these ors and these ands in relation to a simple ladder diagram program here. So we look at a, a motor stop start program here. Uh, start switch is open, stop switch is closed, and the overload is also closed, hopefully. So that means that in the initial stage, uh, this stop here would be green, ready to go. And then we press the, stop, the start button, right, to make it work. So what's the saying? It's saying that if we press start and stop and the overload is good, then the motor will energize. Okay, that's one of the things that we're saying. The other thing we're saying is if the start or the motor and the stop and the overload are good, the coil will be on. So all we're doing is making the translation here. So here we have the start and the motor. So we have an OR function. So start, motor. So in the latter, this is OR, right? We have, it can go this way or it can go this way. Second function is the AND, where we have the output from our OR, which would be sitting right here. So stop and overload. So if we have our OR true and the stop is true and the overload is true and the motor is going to come on. So one of these is true and this is true, and this is true, the motor's going to come on. Does that make sense to most people? Because basically that's all we're doing in this IOM, is we're just trying to understand how to do the same thing in a different language. And, and actually some people find this to be easier. Lots of people do. Okay, so here's a Boolean equation example. Here's a real flashback for you if you want. Remember, uh, makes sense, good. Good to hear it makes sense, Dan. Okay, so another way of expressing it, and we're just showing you this uh, for relationship purposes. There's nothing like this that you guys have to perform, um, but this is the Boolean equation if you've forgotten what that is. Um, which represents what's going on here. Um, I guess the reason that they show it is a good logical representation of the logic. We're basically saying y in order to get y, so y equals all of all of these different things have to happen. A and B have to happen. A and not C has to happen. 
etc 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 so it's another way of looking at it um little explosion down here um, this means this is similar to self-test version of it so good to understand what's going on um so let's see what hap what's going on here so basically it's saying that we have to have this and this and this and this these both have to be true in order for this cue to be happening these both have to be true in order for this cue to be happening and if either one of these happens then Q is going to be true. Twist here uh, is the not block. So this is um, an inverse, actually, right? So if we sit here at this point right now, switch is open, switch is open, switch is open. This is false, and this is false, and this is false, but this is true because it's an inverse, okay? change the switches, different things happen. And the ILM uh, self-test questions basically want to test your understanding of how the logic operates. Okay, so uh, without the not function as a block, this is how we represent it, this little circle right here. So this little with the dash line uh, and, the, and the circle is representing the same thing as a B naught. And I was saying earlier, it's usually represented as a shape and this is that. This is that shape. So we want to understand what the function is here. Uh, and basically, who wants to tell me what has to happen in order for Y to turn on? We're going to stay here until somebody does. Okay, here we go. All right. So A and B have to ring true. So A and B switch closes. That will bring a one over here and that will turn on Y because either one or two needs to be on for Q to be true. Correct. Okay. So then we open the switches again. Uh, and so I'll let someone else go. Yeah. Okay. We did it his way. We closed A and B, which fulfilled the end one and turned the end one Q into a one, which went to the input one of the order block. And in an OR block, only one of the two has to be true, so that turned on Y. We open the switches again. There's another way to turn on Y. Someone tell me what that is. A is true and C is open? Correct. So just closing A. Perfect. So that's that's the expectation of the ILM. It's it's you're not meant to be programming per se but you are meant to understand the flow of data perfect okay more functions uh same kind of deal uh, again as um, ladder diagram almost all the languages can do almost all the functions so uh, function block will be named uh equal or uh, less than or les or GRT or something, depending on the vendor, it'll have a name here, uh, and then it'll be assigned some type of uh, instance name, et cetera, et cetera. Now, but when we're doing math functions, uh, the thing that we is changing here is we're moving from discrete to analog, right? We're changing the data type from Boolean data, when a one or a zero, to an integer or a real number or a timer value. The same thing that we did previously in uh, ladder. Okay, so here's ladder, or sorry, a function block diagram um, of the level. So this is directly the same representation of the uh, that sum example that we looked at in ladder diagram. And what's it saying? It's saying that level alarm 101 will go off if input one or sorry, greater than one or less than one is true. Okay, well, what makes greater than one true? If LT1 is greater than five, I think it was meters from the previous example, then Q is going to be true. And we'll get a one over here, which will turn on the level alarm for a high level. If LT101 is less than 0.25, 
then Q in the last down block will become true. And again, either one being true will turn on the level alarm. And for some reason, this will make the low level alarm. Is that logic pretty easy to translate for most of you? Yeah. Yes, sir. Because that's most of the rest of the ILM. Okay, perfect. Well, I'm not going to explain every single one, um, but this is the this is the idea that we're going for here. Okay, starting to get into some of them that are a little bit um, trickier. Uh, set dominant, reset dominant. The best way to associate this, uh, if we're going to associate, and I think that's the best way to do it, is latching and unlatching. So when we have uh, the latch coil and the unlatch coil in a ladder diagram, this uh, pair of function blocks here, uh, set dominant, reset dominant function blocks, do the same thing. Basically what happens um, if the set dominant one uh, becomes true, it tends to want to stay true. So once it's set and let's say the power goes off, for example, when it comes back on, it's it's still going to be set unless um, unless the re, unless the reset get button the button gets pressed here. So let's see what happens here. Uh, and you can follow the truth tables. Uh, another part of the ILM, I guess, is understanding what happens uh, in the truth tables here. So set and reset are zero. Our Q1 obviously is going to be zero, so the result is going to be zero. Um, set. And reset are zero and the Q1 is a one. So it was previously a one and the power went off and then it comes back on. It's it's still going to be a one uh, and so on. You just kind of work your way through the truth table. And really, um, it kind of complicates things a little bit more because logically, I think you probably understand uh, the idea as, as you go along. But to verify, uh, you go through the truth table uh, and Basically, the idea is the, the set dominant is, is the opposite of the reset dominant, and it works like the latch and the unlatch function of a ladder diagram. We're, again, we're not expecting you to program it, so understanding the function of them um, should, should suffice. Okay, so here's, a, here's an example to maybe, maybe put this in con context a little bit more. So this is an RS. Uh, so we're calling this a reset dominant and pay attention to the fact that this is an RS reset dominant and we're doing this in a motor start, start, stop type situation here. Okay. So uh, just knowing this as a function is valuable because certain function block programs are generic and uh, a motor stop start station, for example, is a very generic program. So it's good to know it in ladder. It's good to know it in function block. It's good to know it in uh, structure text, et cetera, et cetera. So at the end of all this, you should be able to do these little kind of basic building block type programs. Okay, so here we have set reset, which you can kind of consider to be latch and unlatch. And that's the way my brain works. It might not be the same for your brain. So open switch, close switch, uh, closed overload. So when we're sitting here right now, this is looking as a true normally. If it's a, a examine if on, well, this looks like it's on. Uh, this looks like it's on. This looks like it's not on. So we're sitting here with a zero. Uh, we're sitting here with a one. We're sitting here with a one. But we've got an inverse here. So these are zeros at the same time. So this is an or, these are both zeros. We don't have either of them. So Q is also zero. Okay, we press start, which turns as this contact from an open contact to a closed contact, which turns this from a zero to a one. And I get set. And then if we look back at the value here, um, I get a set and I don't have any of the other ones. My result is gonna be a one, which means that my motor is going to turn on. Okay, so I've got a one sitting here, uh, created a one over here, the motor is, is running. Neither one of these things are true currently, so the motor stays running. Uh, I come along and I hit the stop button. Stop button turns this from a one to a zero. 
but this turns from a zero back to a one. And now I have a one or a zero here, which turns this Q true. That sends a one over here. So I don't have a one on this side over here anymore because my finger is off the stop button. Okay, so I have a zero in the set, but I have a one in the reset. So my Q1 result is going to be zero. If I was already at a one, which I was, you can see, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to say that. That was my bad. Okay, you press, you press to reset and it gets uh, reset back to zero by the truth table. So that's how it works. It's not that complicated. Uh, same idea, we press start. This turns into a one. Motor turns on, overload trips. We turn the uh, one to a zero. This turns a zero back to a one. This fulfills the OR requirement. This turns the reset from a zero to a one. And if we go back to the truth table, you can see that it's dominant. So it's going to turn the motor off. Okay. So even if, go ahead, Ray. So just looking at that stuff, um, we don't have like the ladder diagram. You have examine if on, examine if off. With this function yeah. block, we don't have that. So that's why we have the OR gates instead. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. It's the basic same. Yeah. Okay. Basic same. Basic same translation. Uh, translation, except that. Uh, mm -hmm, let me. Yeah. Yeah. That's. That's the translation. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, that was that was this guy here. A um, couple of math functions looks like on this diagram. Orange star. So this is self-test ish e. So we'll walk through this one. Um, representation of again our sum uh, greater than five meters, less than 0.25 meters. We want pump to come on, right? And we want something to turn the pump off. So here we have a set dominant. This was a reset dominant. So we should expect the opposite thing here. Uh, and you'll notice nothing here in terms of the B naught function or the invert function, uh, depending on what language you like to use. So if the level is greater than five meters, this Q is going to be true and it's going to turn on the pump pump is going to stay on until it's told otherwise. Uh, what is otherwise? LT101 being less than 0.25 will give this Q a 1, which will reset the run or unlatch the run if you want to look at that that way. So same idea, different language. Uh, just need to be able to and you way through it, it's, it's logic one way or the other. Okay, more math function blocks. You can see where we're building up here. This is the exact same way we approached the ladder logic. We started with Boolean and then we started with some uh, comparisons and then we did some math. So here we are at math. Math function block, again, type name will change, M-U-L-T, ADD, SUM, whatever, there's lots of different ones. Uh, values for the inputs will be integer, real value, and the output will be, of course, has to be matching. Uh, whatever type of data you have on the left-hand side, you're gonna have the same data on the right-hand side, straight across the board. That's probably like a programming one-on-one -on -one, uh, thing to remember. Data's gotta be the same on this side, when you get out, you can't put an analog transmitter value in here and get a one or a zero out of here and vice versa. Okay, so here's a block diagram representation of uh, a conversion of a flow at standard conditions to flow at uh, flowing conditions. Okay, so we want to convert flowing conditions into standard conditions. This is the math that we have to do. We take the flow. Uh, flow at flowing conditions, we multiply that by the density uh, at flowing, or sorry, the pressure at flowing conditions divided by 
uh, atmospheric pressure multiplied by uh, the standard, which is 15 degrees Celsius plus Kelvin, uh, which is 288 minus our flowing temperature. That's the formula. You probably remember it. How do we do this uh, in function block? Just like this. So what are we doing? We're doing a multiply, this multiplied by this, this divided by this, this divided by this, and then these two things multiply. So it's a little bit confusing, but what we're ultimately going to we're going to get is this QS here, which is the, the number that it spits out at the end. And you'll see how this builds in a couple of a uh, couple of uh, slides. Uh, how we can use this as a as a subroutine, right? Like we did before. Okay, so first thing that we're going to do is take. Um, let's find where we are here. PT. FT right here. So FT 101 Q at flowing conditions is going to be input three of a multiplier block. Okay, because we're multiplying one thing, two things, three things. So this one has nothing that needs to be done to it, so it can go straight into a multiplier block. Then here we have pressure. So pressure here is PT 101. And it says we're going to take the transmitter signal pressure at flowing conditions from PT 101 divided by 325. What the hell? Oh, uh, what the hell is this going on? It looks like on that function block, they want to add those two together for some reason. Yeah, let me just... But you should be this, adding those this, two, right? Well, no, because I, I should have a different formula here because this, this is uh, this is gauge pressure, so we're doing gauge pressure plus atmospheric pressure, and then dividing. Oh, by atmosphere. right, 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 right. That's the correct would be the correct formula, but I guess this is the wrong formula, so I guess I have to fix that. So we're I should have done that. I should have a different formula here. So this is gauge plus uh, absolute in order to get us into uh, absolute pressure, and then we're dividing it by absolute pressure. So that's this function right here right here actually it's right here okay and then this one here I, I, I did the i'll see this one this is how i got it it's adding to yeah I, bad bad formula my bad so it's taking the uh reading from temperature transmitter 101 uh adding kelvin to it and then dividing by kelvin to hear the standard value and, and applying that value as the second parameter for the multiplying block. And then the pressure transmitter was the first multiplying block. And there's a map parameter one in one, in two, in three, gives us a number. And then this number gets shot back to uh, the DCS as a, as a display, whatever it is of the flow at standard conditions. Long story short, a little bit messy. Sorry about that. Um, I'll have to change that formula. And I'm going to find that in the book. I'll make a note of that. Okay. Uh, timer function blocks. Next one's up. Uh, great variety in the formatting of these function blocks between manufacturers as well. So, again, uh, general idea of how they operate. Oh, it is the same formula in the, in the thing here. All right, um, same idea, but great difference in terms of parameter settings. And that's probably the biggest thing uh, different between ladder diagrams and function blocks is that these function blocks can have a, a lot more different parameters. Uh, they'll usually have like little ellipses in the corner here, the little three dots, and you click on it and it, it'll give you all kinds of options and configurations and all kinds of stuff. Um, I've attached a video so you can get at the end of the PowerPoint here uh, so you guys can kind of get an idea of where it's going up that you're necessarily expected to do any of it but I, I just think it's nice for you to be able to see it in real life okay so again on delay timer so we looked at these uh, same same ideas in ladder doing the same thing here so we have an input argument uh, which is boolean so this basically is a uh, an, an enabling bit so turn me on turn me off uh, PT for program time, how long we want it to do its thing, uh, ET for elapsed time, and our output, which is a Boolean, true or false. Uh, data type, 
for timers, and I guess I didn't mention this last time, um, but you'll notice it for sure if you're programming timer block, uh, the different types of data, Boolean, integer, real, uh, et cetera. Timers need timer data, okay? Counters usually have counter data uh, as well. And well. You'll see that as we go by. Okay, so here's an on-delay timer. Uh, same exact process as we looked at in ladder diagram here. We have the conveyor and the siren, and if we remember the drill here, I think it was, yeah, uh, press the button, a uh, horn sounds for 10 seconds, so uh, Ray wakes up on and gets up off the conveyor, and then the conveyor stop, uh, starts, okay? So let's try to walk our, uh, walk our way through here with logically uh, self-test-ish sort of version here. What do we have? We have a start button that's open, and we have stop that's closed. So here's a zero, here's a one, here's a zero, here's a one, here's a one, here is a one with an inverter, so this is a zero. Okay, so I have a zero here and a one here on a reset dominant, which means that this is going to be uh, set Q1 to true. So RS1 Q1 is going to be true. And here's an example, first example of where you see, you know, that you might think, oh, I'll just grab one of those wires and drag it over here and connect it. It doesn't work that way. We assign the wire a name, so this round shape represents a wire name, and then we can use it as a tag as we go through other programs. So that way you don't get all these wires going everywhere, right? It keeps things nice and neat. Okay, so that value, Q1, is a, a true value. It comes over here to the timer on input, which says, okay, timer, let's let's get it on. Uh, my program time is, is 10 seconds. So after 10 seconds, Q will become true, and the conveyor will come on. Phase two, okay, right after the siren comes on for 10 seconds, the conveyor will come on. So this starts that 10 second time. But what also happens? Well, we're in that point where we press the start button, the siren has to come on for 10 seconds. So how does that happen? Press the start button. This is, of course, a one, makes this a one, makes this a one. We've moved it here, but we also moved it down here. So in this instruction, we have an and block. And it's saying if we have the conveyor uh, not running and this wire tag being true, we turn on the siren. And that's the status we have as soon as we press the start button. The conveyor is not running until the 10 seconds elapses, which turns on Q. And then it becomes running. And then this becomes untrue and the conveyor will start. Clear as mud? Yes, sir. Michael? So the, the circle in front of the input of the conveyor at the end, that means not? That's right. This is, uh, this is the same as having a be not function block. Okay. I like to, I, I like, it's an inverse, I like to call it an inverse, but it, it represents a not, basically. Oh, if you don't mind, can you go back to a few pages, which that one for, uh, let me see which page, for page 15. For this one, no. The previous one, page, the, page 15. This one? Um, ahead, ahead. I don't. Page 15 said the mode will start and stop uh, function block diagram. Oh, that's a this one, one, this one. So you stop, it's not, when you press it, it's one. You turn to zero for the input one. Your OL is not, which is one. So you got a zero and the one. So how are you doing the if you input? Okay. Input. So let's look. I'll start at the beginning. Okay. Okay. I have a start contact, which is open. So it's a zero. 
I have a stop contact, which is closed, so it's a one. I have an overload, which is closed, so it's a one. So I have a zero, a one, and a one, okay? This zero is sitting right here. This one hits the inverse and becomes a zero. The overload hits the inverse and becomes a zero. So I have zero here, zero here, and a zero here. If I press the start button, this becomes a one, which sets the motor or turns on the motor, Q1, and this becomes energized or it gets a one, becomes a one. Then what happens if either of one of these, so if someone presses a stop button, if I press the stop button, it turns this from a one to a zero. So this was a zero and then inversed, turns it into a one. Then I have a one or a zero. So Q becomes true, trips the reset. Because it's a reset dominant, the reset will turn off the motor. Same thing with the overload. If this overload is a closed contact sitting here as a one, inverse is a, is a zero. If that overload becomes open, it becomes, a, it's a, it becomes a zero in the field, but the inverser turns it into a one here, and then I have a one and a zero. Either or will make energy, uh, make Q a one, and it will reset or turn off the motor. Clear. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Where do we leave? Uh, this is, is this formula in, what oh, no, ILM is this? Yeah, that's the same formula that's in the ILM. I better do my homework, make sure I can say that properly. All right, so, so this conveyor, that's where we left off here. Uh, you think to about that, that formula that you're looking at, I think it's the right formula. It's just that it has to be absolute numbers. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. I just took it out of context. Yeah. And that's context and communication is key, especially when you're trying to translate different languages. Uh, okay. Uh, on delay. No, we just did this one. Okay. Retentive timer. So retentive timer. Of course, retentive means it retains a value. So retentive timers tally the time a device is on. So the example here is the compressor. See, we have a compressor which has an on light and a service light. So the scenario here is I come along, I start my compressor. While my compressor is running, the on light is going to be on and at the same time, uh, the compressor is running or I haven't looked at the logic closely yet, but we're just stepping back and seeing what's, what do we think is going on. If the compressor is running, we're going to assume the on light is running. And if this is running or this is running, uh, I'm probably counting how long it's running. And after a certain amount of run time, uh, eight hours, 12 hours, 250 hours, the service light is going to come on. So the operator can call in no lights and say, hey, we need to do an oil change. Okay, so that's the way I understand the process. Um, so let's see what it looks like. Um, what are our inputs and outputs looking like? I mean, our inputs looking like here, we have a start button, a momentary start button that's open. We have a momentary stop that's closed and we have a reset button that's closed. So we have a zero and a one and a one. So zero, one, zero, uh, one, zero, one as we're sitting here. And it might not be a bad idea to, you know, maybe write numbers in here as we're cruising through the presentation so you can kind of get an idea of what's going on. Okay, so uh, that's the first thing. As we're just sitting there walking up to this, and that's, that's what we see. So those are the numbers that translate directly from our, our I.O. Um, let's, do the, let's do the functions that are happening within the program. So we know this is a zero already. It's going to stay a zero as it moves into the uh, reset dominant block. The stop one here, the closed contact, or sorry, here is represented as a one right here, but it get, gets inverted. So as it sits right here, it's a zero. Okay, so these are both sitting at zero as we walk up to it. 
Compressor, of course, is zero sitting here. Reset is a one here, but because we have an inverter, it's a zero here. So I got two zeros sitting here. Compressor also sitting at a zero here. Reset is sitting at a one here. So this zero is going to move to here. This one straight across is going to move to a one here. This is an AM block, so I got a zero and a one sitting here. No, nothing's going to happen. They both have to be ones. Okay, so that's where we are walking up to the machine. Then we press the start button. Boom. Open contact, closes, turns this zero into a one, goes straight to here, and turns this set into a one, which turns Q1 true, which turns on the compressor and the on light. Compressor would be uh, addressed zero something four colon zero one and the light would be zero colon four colon zero one for example but we give them names and then the names are attached to a, a bank memory okay so compressor becomes on uh the on light becomes on so this now is a one this now is a one okay so now we're sitting here at an OR. If we have the compressor, which is now a one, or this reset button, which is uh, sitting here as a zero, then the Q option here is going to be true. This is a one, this is a zero. It's an OR, so one or the other turns this Q positive or into a one, and it enables the timer, so the timer starts counting. Da, 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 da. I'm counting and it'll continue to count as long as it wants to uh, up to 20 hours. Okay. After 20 hours, it's going to turn on a service light. Okay. So we have uh, the compressor coming on initially and the reset button not being pressed as, an, as the first enabler for the timer to start. So that says, okay, timer. You can you can do your thing, okay? Then we have an AND block which says we need to have the compressor uh, running and the reset button to be true in order to keep it going. And as we're as we're sitting here now, because this is true, it's true here, it's also true here. This is a close contact. It's also true here. So we have a one and a one here, which turns this Q into a one, which means okay, we're we're counting now. Here we're ready to count. Here, now we're counting. Oh, I hope I didn't just make that mistake. And then it continues counting again for 20 hours. That'll turn on the service light. If at some point in time we were to press the stop button, that would make the compressor and the on light turn off. That would turn, uh, turn that off again and this would turn I would turn that off which would then turn this block off and it would stop the timing it would uh, keep the time until the next time you press start if I just came in and I pressed the reset button that would make this untrue which would make this untrue which would reset the timer back to the beginning and start the timer at zero and you have to start timing again for another 20 hours. That was pretty painful. Okay, so same program we had in ladder, uh, just a little bit different. And we don't really get any worse than, than this, really. Okay, off delay timer uh, works the same way. Uh, the application here is a, a motor uh, that's running. And uh, after you turn off the motor, you want the cooling fan to stay on for a couple of minutes. Okay, so again, um, normally open momentary start, normally close momentary stop. This is sitting here at a zero. This is sitting here at a one. So zero, one, the zero goes to here. This gets inverted. This is also a zero. Press the start button. This turns into a one, which turns on the motor. Motor becomes a one. This motor becomes a one. What the heck is going on here? 
And then what happens here, we press the stop button. Why is this not making sense to me here? Press the stop button, that turns the uh, zero that's sitting here into a one uh, reset dominant. So that's going to turn off the motor. When we lose the motor, this becomes untrue because it's an off timer. That's where I always get mixed up. That is going to start the timing for two minutes at which time Q will de-energize. Got to make sure that you keep the logic between an on and an off straight in your head, uh, or you can do things like I just did there. Okay, counter function blocks, looking at them here. Counters, again, uh, different manufacturers, different requirements. In the ILM, uh, we're going to show you these two blocks here called our trigger blocks. Um, our trig means rising trigger, which means that if we're turning from a zero to a one that's a rising edge so we're idle scanning at zero and then the switch closes and it turns to a one so we're looking for that transition from a zero to a one that's what an R trigger represents so it's just it's a switch basically but it's how we're detecting the switch uh our triggers are usually used for counting up f triggers which are falling triggers are looking for uh, a one down to a zero basically, and that's a falling trigger. Not all software, our software, um, Logix 5000, if I recall correctly, doesn't use these, but uh, you'll find out why if you ever get into this uh, in, in uh, any kind of serious way. Okay, so rising trigger, falling triggers, uh, Boolean variables, true when the clock uh, changes from true to false, False in all other cases. True when clock changes from true to false. False. Believe what the ILM says, don't believe what I say. That's, a, that's all I can tell you. Okay, so uh, here's the counter up down block. So again, different manufacturers, different things, uh, different number of parameters here. So here's an input for counting up, here's an input for counting down. So one block does both. You could have an up block or a down block, and I think that's what we had, or a function and a down function. I think we have that in ladder here. They're combined. So depending on the manufacturer, you're going to get different options. But uh, count up, count down, uh, reset input, uh, load input, which is basically our preset value. Um, our p-value, pv is our current process variable or our current current count, and then some outputs, uh, Q, U, uh, which is true when our uh, counted variable is greater than our PV, uh, QD, true when our counted variable is equal to zero, so counting up and counting down. So we pr program the up value to, you know, count up to 200. Uh, count down, we want to stop counting, you you want to stop counting at zero. Not very often you want to count less than zero. Okay, so here's an example of uh, parkade trans, uh, a transfer from ladder to block. So what do we have? We have a full light in a parkade. Uh, our goal is to turn on the full light. How do we turn on the full light? I don't know. What do we've got? What do we got for inputs here? We've got a, a proximity switch here. It looks like for uh, a car coming in. I've got a proximity switch here, uh, or a motion switch, or some kind of a switch anyway. Counting cars that are going out. I have a, a button uh, for full, and I have a button for empty. So, full button and empty button probably sitting inside the parquet guy shack. And then we have uh, an in and an out button sitting by the, the garage doors of the parkade. So what happens? In button becomes true, turns into a one. It has a rising trigger clock. So it's going from a zero to a one, which is the proper definition for an R trigger, uh, zero to a one. And it turns Q into a one. That one gets sent to the count up 
input of our counter block and it increments our um, PV by one also, right? You won't see it now, but that's what would happen and then increase your PV one also. Um, once our PV is hit at 200, so 200 cars come in, the switch goes up and down 200 times, it hits uh, the, the preset value for this counter. We're gonna want the light to come on. So count up will be fulfilled, PV will be greater than or equal to our count up value and the full light will come on. That's one option. As a car drives out, we want it to go down. So let's say we're sitting at 200 and a car drives out, that turns the uh, switch that's open closed, which turns this from a zero into a one, which turns this into a one, which sends a one to the countdown function of this block. So by nature of its internal function, it's going to take one off of the PV automatically. You don't even see it. And that's kind of the joy of function blocks is that a lot of the things that you have to do several rungs for or a math function for in ladder diagram are self-contained in a function block. And remind me when we get to uh, scaling later because it's a great example. And actually, it's the reason I attached uh, the video today uh, um, is because of um, the functionality that you get with function blocks over ladder diagrams. Okay, so the car drove out, uh, the motion detector, whatever, sensed it. Uh, it sent a, a one to the countdown of our counter block, which decreased our uh, process variable by one. And this now is sitting at 199. Um, 200 cars more drive out. Every time a car drives out, this decreases um, by one until, uh, until it reaches zero and then it's zero. We don't have an empty light or anything, so we don't have to worry about it. So that's what would happen in those two situations. Uh, a couple other situations could happen. Uh, the guy might want to go watch the hockey game instead of working, so he presses the full button. Uh, what the full button is going to do, let's see here, the full button is a zero right now, so sitting is a zero. I push the button, the zero turns to a one, and the Boolean data represented by this dash line, it sends a one to load. What load does <clears throat> is it will send the preset value straight into our uh, count up value. Okay, once it does that, it's going to turn on the full light. Okay, the guy goes to the hockey game, comes back. Uh, from the hockey game and decided he's going to do some work so he needs to reset everything so he's going to hit the empty button so the empty is a zero sitting here it's a zero press the button press the button uh sends a one to the reset input the reset input becomes true and that counts uh turns our uh, preset value comparison down to a zero and if there were an empty light uh, you could turn on an empty light so again, um, it's logic. Your job is to try to translate from one to the other. Okay, subroutines can be done in function block as we have done in ladder diagrams. Same descriptive names as we had seen before. So jump to subroutine, subroutine. Uh, things that are a little bit different are of course the naming of the, of the parameters, so input parameter return parameter, uh, data types can be Boolean, integer, or real, uh, so on and so forth, just as we had before. Um, here's what it looks like. And here's a, a dirty version of the scaling, excuse me, subroutine that we had before. So here we have a couple of temperature transmitters. And here's where it's going to make a little bit more sense to you. Uh, I know there are some questions about subroutining later. And we said that we can take uh, the analog inputs from all of our transmitters and we can have them executed by one subroutine instead of having a subroutine associated uh, ladder logic for each individual one of these. And this is where you first start to get to 
going to see this. So here we're taking input uh, input one from slot five, channel zero, so TT101. Here we have uh, input one, slot five, channel one, or TT102, both as our input parameters for a jump to subroutine. We get an input parameter there, a subroutine will uh, get called up, it'll do its map, and it'll return a number here that represents our scaled value for our input of uh, our route value from our transmitter. Okay, so what is inside the jump to subroutine? Once that signal uh, is there, it goes to the subroutine. So here's the subroutine, notice subroutine is uh, named convert. Same subroutine here is named convert. So this is a function, the ladder diagram that gets executed for this transmitter, but you notice it doesn't have all of this separately. You do this once and you just plunk it in there. So it's kind of awesome, right? So this is doing all the same things as our input output formula. Again, it's taking a, a digital number from our transmitter and converting it into uh, engineering units. So here, subroutine raw value, that's what these values here are raw values from our subroutine. So we're subtracting our raw value from our transmitter from our uh, lower range value, right? Input. Uh, input minus LRV of the input divided by span of the input, which is 49,931. So that's the first part of our input output formula, right? Input minus LRV of the input over the span of the input. And then we go to uh, divided by the span of the input. And then we're going to multiply that by something. What do we multiply it by? We multiply it by the uh, output. Uh, output span, is that right? Output span. Okay, so we're yeah, it's the input output. span plus the lower range value. This is just the input output formula. So it multiplies it by the multiplies this by the output span and the output lower range value. So that's what we're that's what we're doing here uh, in is in this function here. So we're multiplying this and then subtracting the lower range value. So this is giving our, uh, you know, our level in meters or our uh, percent output scale. And then it's going to return it to the main routine as output scale. Don't ask why this isn't up here. They don't feel it's necessary for you to see the whole thing from front to back. Um, but that's what it does. It's going to return this value to a place in the main program called out scale. Um, but it's not shown here. Don't worry about it above your pay grade. Uh, if and when we get this far in labs, I don't know if this is one of the ones that we need to do, uh, but if we do, uh, it'll become evident then. There's no point showing it, I think, is, and the reasoning why they're not showing it is because all the different manufacturers are so different that it probably doesn't make sense to do unless you're staring at the version you're working with. Okay, so that was your intro to structure, uh, sorry, to function block diagram. Uh, now we're going to get into uh, structured text. So another language, the third one that we're looking at out of the, out of the five, uh, six, eleven, thirty-one uh, languages. Structured text is used to implement complex procedures that cannot be easily expressed with graphical languages, such as ladder diagram and function block diagram. So when we're talking about the five different languages here, uh, our objectives are to learn a little bit about each of them. Uh, and part of that learning that you need to learn is what makes them uniquely uh, beneficial in what applications. So structured text, the specific statement that's made in the ILM that you see here is applications that cannot be easily expressed with graphical languages such as ladder and function block. That's the kind of thing that we're looking at. Um, I'm pretty sure in function block, there's probably a little blurb somewhere in the ILM that says function block diagrams are great for um, this type of application. And those are the things I want you to make sure that you look for, because that's one of, that's one of the objectives. Yeah, Ray? Yeah, just a heads up on that converter, the last section, you've got a subtract note right on that page. You see how you got a subtract at the bottom, that negative 50 subtract? 
Yeah. That should be an ad. And they have it right in the book. But you just need to correct it on your slide there. Oh, great. Thanks for letting me know. Yeah, no worries. I'll, I'll, try, to, I'll try to remember that. What page is that? 25? Uh, 26 on my book there. On, on yours? Let's see here. Oh, yeah, look at that. Uh, yeah. PPT check. Maybe not check. Maybe wrong. Okay, right on. Thanks, Ray. I appreciate that. There is so many, uh, there were so many errors in the fourth year ILMs, and there still are. Um, we're still recovering, and we got a meeting at the end of the month. A bunch of us instructors are getting together and going through these ILMs and hopefully straightening them out. Go ahead, Michael. Do we have any incentives if you find any bugs in the textbook? Then that may uh, help us to improve the quality very quickly. Um, you know what? I usually have a document. I'm joking, okay? I hope you did not consider this as serious. <laughs> no, actually, there is a document that has fourth year ILM errors in it, and I'm, I'll throw it in here today. There's, a, I did just finish third year too in the fall, and I definitely noticed, I'd say probably 90% of the books had, had errors in them. They absolutely whether, do. You know, whether it's just spell checks, but uh, even like answers in the back of the book weren't weren't correct that I had to yeah. Yeah. figure out. So. Yeah, and I will tell you right now that there are or were lots of them in the fourth year ILM. So if at any point in time you find yourself really banging your help, but I guess, you know, you're doing a question and you're in the self-test and you're doing the math seven different ways and the answer's still not getting there, stop and email me um, or check the document that I'll add into the course content today because there are definitely some ILMs with errors in the self-test. Uh, hopefully I'll identify them as I do the PowerPoints, but uh, again, you guys, uh, sometimes I've just become blinded, you know, you can't see the uh, forest for the trees kind of thing. Um, so yeah, if you see mistakes, let me know, but I will throw that document in there today. All right, so structured text, again, uh, used for things that are hard to express with picture languages, such as ladder and function blocks. So uh, we can do almost all the same thing, again, in this language as we could in function block or uh, ladder, um, but it's different. Uh, so I start losing qualifications at about this level here. Uh, I have a fairly basic understanding, hopefully a little bit more of a basic understanding than you guys do. Um, don't get it in your head that you have to become a guru at this because you don't. You just have to mostly distinguish the differences between them and your strongest thing and the most beneficial thing for you as a, as a trades person is to make the connections in your head between similar processes and different languages. I think that's a lot easier for you to take away with you uh, in the long run than it is, uh, you know, probably remembering uh, the specific names that are associated with the, you know, the syntax of this type of programming. Go ahead, Michael. Have you ever seen any process control programs are programmed with all this kind of multiple languages? Uh, well, only in the lab, uh, we do, we do a, prior to COVID, uh, when, you know, we could spend as much time as we wanted to together, uh, the labs would build up from, we'd do a function block lab, or we'd start with a ladder lab, then we'd do a function block lab, and then I had a lab where we did all, all three different, we did three different languages, and we used subroutines, all, we kind of wrapped them all up into one lab. Um, it takes a, a lot of hours to get to that stage. Uh, and if you don't do it every day or month or year even, like for me, it's a year usually between these classes, it's very easy to forget. Um, so I don't think that we're probably going to get there, but short and long answer to your short question is yes, you will have uh, uh, control schemes that have all the different languages in them. Thank you. Okay, so moving on. Structured text uh, is all in text, first of all. Um, so we'll be looking at things called assignment statements, and this is just like saying, uh, 
LT underscore 101 is tied to uh, slot 05 input channel 01. They do that, but we do this in, in ladder diagrams um, using addressing. They do it in something called an assignment statement. Then they have function calls, uh, another term that describes uh, what goes on conditional statements. So these are ifs, ands, ors, that type of stuff. Uh, and then we have iteration statements, which are the more complicated comparison uh, type statements. So we'll look at all of these. Uh, I'm by no means uh, an expert on structured text algorithms, so we're going to keep it well within the boundaries uh, of the ILM. Okay, but again, uh, we're going to be looking at similar processes, different languages. Okay, so we'll start out with assignment statements, uh, and we'll talk about first, uh, get this out of the way, syntax. Uh, and that is the language rules for the assignment statement. And syntax is just the way you have to write it. It's like another way of saying grammar. Okay, when we're, when we're programming, we call it syntax. Uh, when we're writing an essay, we call it grammar. That's the closest relationship I can make anyway. Okay, so an assignment statement, this is the general form, variable, whatever it happens to be, then you'll have, uh, oops, sorry about that, you'll have this colon equal sign, and then an expression, and then it ends with a semicolon. So this is a, this is a standard format, so it'll be, I could make it simpler by going uh, x, colon equal sign, x, semicolon. That's the format for an assignment statement. And to me, when I read the ILM, we, this didn't really make it clear, but it's, you gotta understand that it's clear. So it's like saying, I need to enter something here. I need to enter something here. This is part of the language that has to be there. This is part of the language that has to be there. Okay, so colon equal sign is the assignment symbol. So. I'm assigning something, something, okay? The variable uh, is an internal or external output tag. Uh, the variable and expression must be the same data type. So just like all the other languages we looked at, the input and the output have to be the same language. You can't have Boolean in and integer and real out. It's the same thing. Nothing changes, just different, different language. Okay, the semicolon separates and ends statements. So again, must be there, okay? It's, it's like, uh, I don't know, it's like having the end of a, a rung on each side. You gotta have this and you gotta have this. It's just the way it's gotta be. Okay, so let's kind of look at it. <clears throat> okay, here's an assignment statement. So what, what do we have? We have light X, light Y, and light Z, coil X, coil Y, coil Z, we have switch A, switch B, switch C, uh, connected to uh, our I.O. So we have our I.O. Uh, contacts for all of these different switches. This one's a, a not or a inverse or off, three languages now. What's going on? So let's interpret what's going on here saying, this is saying if A and B are true, X will come on, okay? That's what this run says. This run says if A or B are true, Y will come on. And this one says if C is not true, Z will be on. So if we're sitting here right now, this is not on, this is not on, is this on? Yes, sir. Yes, it is. Because it's a it's a not. It's a zero sitting here. This is the opposite basically of that. So it is green, which means that this is on. So let's look at this in structured text. So this is if we're looking at this in function block, this would be uh, input one is A, input two is B. We have an and block, and our output would be X, right? Structured text, we're gonna say that X is equal to, or 
remember we got to have this semicolon equal to is equal to a and b it's words so logic wise it makes pretty good sense semicolon closes off that instruction that's the same way as saying that's rung one what's rung two saying it's saying that y will be true if a or b are true end of rung semicolon z will be true if the function that i assign to it is not c so if c is not true z will be true so this is a structured text conversion you don't have to go to much worse than this i guess that's kind of a lie uh, little stepping stone so pretty basic and or not um, and you can recognize it as a function just like you rec can recognize this as the same setup just as you can recognize the same setup in a function block diagram if you can under understand these same little groups or functions and how they translate between each other all we're going to be doing is building on them okay so that's an assignment statement i'm, I'm assigning this function to this variable, right? So here's the variable, here's the expression. Here's the variable, here's the expression. And again, five languages in five days is pretty much impossible to do. So again, don't stress out too bad uh, if you don't become a guru. Okay, so motor star and stop program, one of our uh, classic staple programs here in ladder diagram was it say to us it says uh, if the start or the motor is true and the stop is true and the overload is true the motor will come on so what's our variable here our variable is motor what's our expression something or and and right so expression motor will be true, colon, equal sign, don't miss, will be true, and you can kind of go, I don't, I don't like to say if, because there's actually a command in structured text called if, but basically motor will be true if the start or the motor and the stop and the overload are true, end of run. So your basic requirement for the whole, this whole ILM is to be able to take a picture of this let's say i gave you this and i said here's a b c and d which structured text line represents the ladder diagram show them up that's as, as deep as you need to get okay pump lift station here we go a little bit different here showing it in a block diagram what's our variable well our variables are latch one variable is latch two Variable is P3, or slot zero. What are the expressions attached with them? Well, this one is going to be LT30 is less than six. This one is going to be LT30 is greater than five. And this one is going to be latch one or P30 and not latch two. So let's see how close I am here. Okay, variable one, latch one. LT30 greater than 6.0, semicolon to close off. Right? LT30 greater than 6.0. Right? Latch 2, same idea. Latch 2 is LT30 less than 0.5. LT30 less than 0.5, semicolon. We don't get into making any programs in structured text. You just need to understand the these smaller blocks okay and then the last rung of course here p30 will come on when if latch one or p30 latch one or p30 and not latch two are true i don't know why i just licked my finger to change the powerpoint slide that was very weird okay so, uh what do we got here standard flow conversion calculation here again so this is that one that i messed up uh, last time what's happening we're taking the raw 
values uh, at flowing conditions from a flow transmitter, a pressure transmitter, and a temperature <coughs> transmitter, and we want to convert it into uh, flow at standard temperature and pressure. So we're doing some we're doing some math on it. So what is our variable here it is FTS 101 over here, and what is happening? Well, the first thing we're doing is PT 101 plus 101.325. So PT101 plus 101.325. Then what's next? And then we're dividing that by 101.325 over 288. Wait a second, no, we're not. I just 101.325. The vision is getting older and older. Okay, so that represents this first chunk right here. What's happening uh, down here? We have 200 and yeah, it's not showing the stupid numbers here again. Anyway, uh, we're dividing 288.15 by the temperature transmitter plus Kelvin here, which is temperature transmitter plus Kelvin here divided by 288.15. So that is this chunk right here. So those are our input one value. This whole little mess here is our input two value. And then the flow, we are taking straight as a value as input 3. And it gets multiplied 1 times 2 times 3, which is 1 times 2 times 3. So this is just about as tricky um, as it's going to get for us, um, recognizing what's going on here. Um, make yourself comfortable with how the logic converts. All right, next up, function block call. So here's where we start getting into some wiry stuff, uh, almost mean, uh, because you don't really get to experience it. And without experiencing it a lot, it's difficult to relate to. Uh, but the next thing we're going to talk about is, is called structured text function block call. So all function blocks used in ladder diagrams and function block diagrams can be called within a structured text program. So an add block, a subtract block, a greater than block, uh, a move block, all of those things. So you're like, wow, this is still words, but I can still get the same functionality. Uh, long story short. Okay, so again, it's all about syntax, uh, spelling, spaces, brackets, colons, equal signs, semicolons, got to be bang on. Um, it takes practice. Okay, so how do we call up a function block or how do we even name a function block? It relies on the different syntax here. So block name is the instance name of the function block. So we assign the function block the instance name. Um, way back several slides ago, so um, I don't know, map this, divide this, whatever it is, uh, in underscore parameter one to parameter n, uh, any number of parameters for the function block. And what I guess it's dirty that they mention this um, because input parameters uh, in function blocks, as I said earlier, they tend to have a lot more configurability. Uh, compared to a ladder diagram where you got to put in, you got to apply a bit every time you do it. In a function block, you just click on the corner of the block and you can just add inputs and outputs to your to your blue in the face, basically. Okay, so block name is the instance instance name of the function block that we're interested in. The in par one variable to in par n variable are just a, a number of parameter arguments for that block name. So it could be one plus two plus three plus four plus five plus six plus seven plus eight plus nine, whatever it is. Okay. Semicolon ends that instruction. Okay. Next line result. This is a uh, assignment now because we're assigning something to this name. So this assignment is block name return parameter one. Okay. So block name return parameter one to block name return parameter n. That just means the infinite number of block name return parameters as you have them numbered. Okay. 
functions. This is the function block syntax. It's, it's all about syntax. And in my humble opinion, this is beyond what you should be introduced to in a few hour class. Um, but this is the way it is. So know that this little collection here, this collection of syntax is called a function block call. That's the minimum requirement. Okay. So conveyor belt, belt startup here. Let's look how this ladder diagram converts to um, structured text and how we can pull in how we can pull in a, a function block. In this case, we're going to be using a timer on function block. How do we pull that into a uh, structured text equation? Okay, so first thing here, we have an expression that says latch one will become true if start or latch is true and stop is true. That's rung number one, semicolon. Okay, rung number two, our variable here is timer on. And we're saying that timer on is a function of latch one. And our preset time for timer one is 10 seconds. Close the brackets, put the semicolon. I'm, you know, it's, it's a language. Uh, that's all I can tell you. This is the direct translation between this and that. And for our pay grade and the amount of time that we have for this, um, recognition is the goal here. Okay, third rung, we have siren as a variable. Our expression is going to be a flat one and not T on one Q. We'll get the siren. So here we go. Siren is our variable. Our expression is latch one and not T on one Q. And you can see now here that we're calling T on one Q function block. Okay, we're calling on T on, we called on it here. Now we're, we're calling on a specific variable inside that T on one Q function block. Last run variable is conveyor one and it's basically saying T on one Q. And this is how we write it, T on one Q. So this T on one Q comes from within the function block, which in this case, the instance name is T on underscore one. Whew. Get winded sometimes. Okay, cooling fan timer. One more little thing here. Uh, I, I'm not going to go through it. I guess I am going through all of them. I wasn't going to when I first started. Um, but again, Identify what's going on. Here's the motor and the fan. We're going to call on a function block here, a reset dominant function block. We have the T off uh, function block. Uh, one of them is called RS underscore one. So that's our instance name. The other one uh, timer is instance name T underscore one. So first thing we do is we uh, assign it to the function block. So function block. RS1 is going to be using the internal variables, these guys here, internal parameters, start and stop, okay, the internal parameters. Our variable here is motor. Our requirement here is motor will come on if RSQ1 is true. This becomes true and motor comes on. Okay, next function block we're assigning is T underscore one. Its internal parameter variables are motor and T uh, timer, two minute timer input. So these are internal parameters, close off parentheses. What is the output of it? The output of it is the variable fan and it will be true when T one Q becomes true. So, uh, repetition and practice is the only thing that's going to make you good at this. Uh, the good news for you is I do not invent formulas, programs, ladder logic, function blocks of my own. So you will not see any programs like this or any programs like this that you have not seen before. It's more about understanding the flow of logic 
and the, the translation between the languages and where they're best applied. Okay, here's the parquet one again. So third, third language, same process. What do we have? We have a couple of function blocks named r underscore trig one and two. We have a function block count up down named count up down underscore one. We have a variable named full underscore l. We've got input parameters named in, out, empty, full, and 200. So you'll see all of them in here. And uh, just again, assigning, right? Assigning r trig one to input parameter in, r trig two input parameter out, count up down parameters including. Uh, our trig, our trig, the Q values of these two blocks, plus the value of the empty switch, plus the amp value of the sem, uh, full switch, plus the value of our preset of our counter block. So translate, 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 recognize the syntax, exercise, practice, repeat, rinse. That's all I can say. Okay, uh, structured text function call. What was I just doing there? Function block call. Okay, so that was function block call. Function call itself. <clears throat> so uh, function, what does it say here? Function call does not require the creation of an instance name. So different than a block and the fact that it doesn't have a name in here, uh, the function block call does not require the instance name uh, square root underscore x or whatever. Let me just look at the ILM here. Why is this look foreign to me? Yeah, so this is just uh, this is just like grabbing a tab in uh, a ladder a ladder diagram where you can just go up and grab something and drag it drag drag it down here. Um, it's kind of just a shortcut for uh, simple functions. All right, so that was pretty, this pretty basic structured text. Uh, and by pretty basic structured text, I mean more complicated than things we've probably looked at before, or in my opinion, uh, more complicated than we looked at before, because this was just Boolean stuff. This is just the Boolean stuff. So let's look at what happens as we get into uh, things are, are a little bit more complicated. So here we have something called the conditional statement. And again, this section is all about um, recognizing the different structured text statements. So we did an assignment. We've done a function call. Now we're going to do a conditional statement. Okay, so conditional statements look like this in terms of syntax. If this is true, then this thing turns on or off, or this thing is on or off. This is a one or a zero, or this is a one or a zero, or this is true, or this is false. Or else, if this happens, then this happens, or this happens, and then it's building. So we start out with if. Okay, but you didn't mean to scare you, I guess, but we start out with if, and then we kind of look at that, and then we can throw an else if in there, and then we can throw an else in there, and then we throw this in there. So it kind of builds up, but these are condition statements. So they're basically look like if, and then then, or else if, and then then. So we look at these individually as we go along here. Okay. So let's see what, what the heck that means here in relation to something that you probably do understand. We recognize our, uh, our pump scenario here again. Uh, we have if level transmitter 30 is greater than six, latch number one. If LT30 is less than five, unlatch number, or, uh, latch number two comes on. And basically what happens here, high level turns on the pump, low level turns off the pump. So what does that look like here? If LT30 is greater than six, then lots one equals true. Or else, or meaning if this isn't true, 
then notch one equals false. I wish I could tell you more about this. This is just the conversion. That's, that's what it is. And to end this off, this run will be N if. And it's confusing because you're thinking end if what? And that's not the way, that's not what it means. That's when I, when I read it, I go end if what? It just means end the if function. This is saying we're doing an if function. This is saying we're ending the if function. Okay, so this is the first rung, believe it or not. So you can see how ladder logic or maybe function block diagram is, is better for this type of thing compared to this. Like you got to type all this. So this doesn't sound as fun to me as going uh, drag, drop, drag, drop, drag, drop, done, right? So pay attention to that as, as a feature or a disadvantage of structured text. Okay, second line, what is going to be if LT30 is less than 0.5, then latch two. So if LT30 is less than 0.5, then latch number two is equal to a true. If not, or else, latch true is then false. That's the way we write it. And if closes the run. Okay, it just is. That's the way it is. Just like, just like we have a line here, we have end if semicolon here. Okay, and then the last run here, a little bit more complicated here. We have this, if this or this and not this is true, the pump will be on. Okay, so if latch one or P30 and not latch two, then the pump is true. Or else the pump is false. That's, that's structured text. Anybody here believe this is fun? Nay. Neither. Me either. But it is a necessary evil and it does have a, a place. Okay, gas detector. Again, I don't think I'm going to walk through every single one of these with you, but the idea here is I give you the picture of the latter version because I think that's probably the easiest to understand for most of us. Uh, give you the latter version. And then we look at the particular expression and the syntax that's associated with translating it into our current language, which in this case is structured text. So starts with an if, ends with an NF, has a bunch of goodies in between. So I could walk through every one of these, but I'm starting to get winded and I'm not sure what condition my daughter's in. Um, yeah, nice. Okay, uh, iteration statements. I have to laugh because uh, this was in my old PowerPoint and I went to my new ILM version 22 this morning because I was kind of trying to revamp things here a little bit. And I thought, oh, they must have removed that, but they didn't. So this is still in the ILM on page 42. It says uh, iteration statements and it says they're used for repetitive tasks. And it says we don't really, we don't really talk about it here. So pretty funny, but it would make a great test question just because it got its own slide. All right, in summary, function block diagram, FBD, structured text, ST, and sequential function chart, which I didn't even touch on. Is that what we supposed to do? No. Uh, uh, sequential function charts are next. That's the next book, so you can read that ahead if you want. Uh, it's even funner than structured text, in my opinion. Uh, our three, not other, our three PLC languages specified by IEC 61131-3. That might be an important number. Each of these languages excel in different programming applications, but if needed, they can be, or they can all produce a similar result, and lots of times they can be used all inside the same controller or same program. Okay, uh, answer all the questions in the back of the ILM. Make sure you understand the logic as you go through the different programs. I will change the video or I'll change the PowerPoint and course content after I log off with you guys here today to include uh, the edits I made on the one we saw today and this link. This link is a 15 minute video by somebody I just pirated this morning off the internet. Um, but it shows you RS5000. 
<coughs> not sorry, <clears throat> Logix 5000, which is the platform we use, one of the platforms we use at the college, and it introduces you into function blocks. And I didn't really watch the whole thing. I just kind of grabbed snippets of it as I looked at it. But it looked to me like he kind of walked you through from, from ladder to, to function block. And it seemed like it would be a good video. 14 minutes, uh, probably worth your time in light of the fact that we're not going to get the seat time in the lab that you probably wish you had. Um, but again, if you end up doing this as a major portion of your job, you're going to be go going to uh, get some specialized training for at least a few weeks. So that is it for the PowerPoint. So I'll shut the recorder off.